Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Um, welcome to the Canaries in the Coal Mine session and I'll be explaining what all that means. Um, but I would first of all like to, first of all, thanks everybody for coming. We had a session this morning which went very well, although we were interrupted by a fire alarm, so hopefully that won't happen this time. Um, if you need, if you can't hear very well or you um, need a bit of assistance with your eyes, there's going to be a, an online demonstration later, so you might want to come forward, see how you go. Um, anyway, thank you for coming along today. My name is Maggie and I'm the manager of the board's function which relates to trust investigations and I'm also looking after a function which is based on risk-based regulation and I'm going to tell you more about that later. And I've worked at the board for 11 years. My colleague Shaleen is a trust advisor, she's been with the board for 15 years um, and when you contact the board typically through registry or telephone it will usually be Shaleen who you talk to, so some of you may recognise her name and now recognise her face, um, and Shaleen will be able to solve all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy um, has worked for the board for three years and worked in IT, and she implements system improvements, which is, and she's going to show us today some of the, what's happening with the online changes. We also have Ashling, who you met at reception, um, who's worked for the board for three days, and she's the, um, one of our newest recruits and she's in education and outreach, so that's who we are. Some of you may know Christine Bell, um, who is our trust account analyst, and you might be wondering where Christine is. Christine's had a lot of input into these sessions, and the only reason she's not here today is she's damaged her ankle and she can't walk on it. Um, so she's still very much part of the team though. I'll let you know that the session today is being recorded, and it's also on a live webinar. So that means that if you ask a question, that will be broadcast and recorded. So if you want to ask a question that you would rather not be recorded, come and ask us afterwards. Okay, canary in the coal mine. So some of you may know that a canary in a coal mine is a metaphor or um, what was used in the old days down when people went down coal mines. They would take the canary in the little cage down the coal mine because the canaries were more susceptible to carbon monoxide and methane than humans were. So if the canary died, it was time for the humans to leave. So that's where it comes from. Um, obviously, we're not going to be sending you into hazardous areas where you get gassed or anything like that, but, but it's a, a signal of an early warning system. And that's what the external examiners are to the board. There are early warning systems, so you are our canaries. All right, now, what will you take away from today's session? So you will learn how vital your work is to what the board is trying to do. We are trying to protect consumers of legal services and we're trying to effectively regulate the legal profession and you help us to do that. You will also take away um, an understanding of how you fit into the jigsaw puzzle of legal regulation in Victoria. So some of you may know this already, some of you may not, but I'm going to let you all know how you fit into the puzzle. You'll also hear about some improvement that we've made, and that is based in part on what you've told us we need to do better, so we have made some changes. And you'll also see a step-by-step -step online demonstration um, of what's new for this new cycle of reporting, which will be starting next week. Well, at the end of the year is next week. You'll be coming into the picture a bit later. And then hopefully what we will take away from this session is a stronger relationship with you. And that is one of the biggest parts of why I'm here today, to make sure that we do have a good and strong relationship and that we understand each other and that we can work well together. We also want to increase and improve our support of you in any way we can. So I'm very, very interested to hear feedback. And what I commit to do is I commit to listen to what you have to say and make those changes if we can. That will be current issues and emerging issues. So there will be things that come up in the future that will need uh, particular um, answers to them and we commit to continuing the conversation with you. Okay, so the, legal, uh, the Victorian Legal Services Board and Commissioner. So I'm sure you all know, know who we are, but just in case you don't. So we're two statutory organizations um, and we operate under the uniform law. 
Um, as you probably know, the Uniform Law covers Victoria and New South Wales, and Western Australia have committed to come into the scheme from the 1st of July 2020. So slowly, slowly, we're hopefully picking up all the states in, Victor in, in Australia and, and we will be a national scheme. We have a new commissioner. Well, she's been on board for about just over a year now. That's Fiona McClay. Um, and she has conducted a strategic review. And as part of that review, she says that we have three main functions. The first function is to protect consumers by effective regulation of the legal profession. And in this context, you fit into that puzzle. You uh, minimise harm done to the, pub, to the public because you police erratic behaviour and report it to us and you ensure that there's proper record keeping by law firms. The second thing we do is we manage the public purpose fund and that um, enables effective regulation to take place. Now that's not something you particularly have a role with but the public purpose fund um, invest money that comes out of solicitors trust accounts and it pays for things like Victoria legal aid so that is a huge component of access to justice in this state and then the third main function is to support the legal profession to achieve the highest standards of ethics and legal practice and you have a very big role in that in your work when you talk to your legal practitioners you are educating them by showing them where things are not done correctly how to correct those mistakes in doing all this, our, um, what we do at the moment is we apply a risk-based approach to the way we work. As I mentioned, I'm running a project on that, so I will tell you a little bit more about that later. We will have time for questions at the end, but if anybody wants to put their hand up and ask a question because they, they'd like a bit more information, I'm more than happy to have questions along the way. Okay. So where do you fit into the puzzle of legal regulation in Victoria? So as I say, you fit into the overall purpose of practice by helping us both protect and Because you routine, you go on a routine cycle once a year to visit sometimes that is the only investigative practice. We used to do uh, what the, the, the LIB used to do, uh, I'd say every firm on a five year cycle. We do not do that anymore. It's a risk based approach. Those firms who are doing well, you are the only link to that author. That's a pretty important thing. The other part of your role is to teach, to remind the lawyers, as I say, about the rules to help them. Finally, you let the board know if they're do that typically when you do your external report. The board, they will look at it, but also you can let us know outside of that site. I'll talk about that later too. Okay, so the risk based approach that we are adopting. What happened was risk based regulation is something that is uh, common within a lot of regulations. And they did a, an analysis of the specific worth of data that the board and commissioner held. So, as you may be aware, the board um, has data about people, for instance, when you want to be admitted, your name, your age, location of the county, when you were admitted, those disciplinary findings about you. So, all this information is going to be Melbourne University. Is that the I think it's really experience from people online. Okay. So I have sent a message out to ask them to me. Okay, all right, well we'll carry on. <laughs> um, so Melbourne University took a 10 year slice of data and they worked out what does that data tell us? And what it told us was that there are certain characteristics of legal practitioners you are higher risk of attracting a complaint. Now I could talk to you all day about this, but I'm keeping this component quite small unless we want to talk about it later. And that analysis tells us that the most reliable factor determining whether you will be you will have a complaint made against you, whether the lawyer will have a complaint made against you. So we, we 
are committed to doing something with that data. Why we have moved to a risk-based approach. So from the characteristics of the cells, we can look and we can make risk of a new event. It means uh, a score out of 100, which is how likely are you, lawyer, to have a new complaint? But what happened in last year's cycle, when all part C is in the full we looked at that, put that information together with the prone score of the particular law firm or lawyer, and that made us determine what we were going to do. So that is our risk-based approach. And we will do the same this year. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we use your, your uh, materials soon. Am I all right to keep going? Yeah. Okay. So Melbourne University also looked a bit deeper at the characteristics of lawyers who have gone on to have disciplinary action taken about them. So that's the commission's function. And the VCAT is the tribunal that hears the cases. They looked more deeply at those uh, lawyers who had had disciplinary proceedings against them and um, some of it had to do with trust record keeping, some of it didn't. But the information, um, although it's not routinely collected, it's extremely telling. And again, we want to use this information. The way we determined it is we've said these are red flag moments. So when we see a red flag moment, we know to look more closely at the lawyer and what's happening within the practice because the data is telling us that kind of person tends to go on and get into more trouble along the way. And we would like to build a bridge at the top of the hill rather than send the ambulance to the bottom. So what are red flag events? So things like delaying in completing work. It shows you that the law firm is struggling a bit and that can be submitting their parts A and B. That's delaying work. Um, it could also be delaying their legal work, of course. Um, it could be drug and alcohol abuse. Those are red flag moments that have come up through the tribunal decisions. You not being able to get in touch with those, law those lawyers to make your appointments to go and see them, or indeed their clients not being able to get in touch with them, or the regulator not being able to get in touch with them, or then pushing back to the ATO when the ATO wants to ask them questions. This is a law firm that's not working um, in the way we would like them to work. And it might, of course, be that it's just a small blip, um, and that's fine. So if, if that came along, we would have a look at it and see what was going on. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about how you might be our eyes and ears in relation to those red flags. So what do we do with the information when you provide it? I don't know whether you know this or not, but I think it's very important that you do understand what we do with your, uh, the information from your hard work at the law practices. So you upload the information into our system, and then we have a look through to see whether any rules have been breached. If we find that there's lots of practices who don't breach any rules, which is fabulous, they've obviously got things running well. If there are some practices who have breaches in there, we will look at them and we will determine whether that's a serious breach or whether it's not. And then we will look at their prone score and determine what we should do following on from there. So if you are somebody who has had a disciplinary history and you've committed something in the medium range, we will probably more likely look at you than if this is the very first time you've committed a breach and it's in the medium range. So we take a sliding scale. The things that we would look, about, look at um, in components of, we would look at the Crown score, but we would also look at what else we know about the practice because sometimes we come across information that's not strictly within the bounds of information the board collects. And it might be, um, things that the lawyer or their own staff has tell, told the board about. Sometimes we get reporting by staff members. It would be their disciplinary history. It would also be their practice history. How they, if it's to do with um, trust record keeping, how have they been keeping them in the past? So for instance, one of the things that we looked at last year was we said, this person has con you know, committed a medium range offense. And they've also been late in submitting their parts A and B. And this is the fifth time in a row that they've done this. So that person will certainly get a, 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 a closer look than somebody who has a, a cleaner history. And that, you're nodding in the room and that all makes sense, of course. So what do we do then? We then engage with the law practice. If we've decided we need to, we will engage with them. We might just telephone them. We might exchange emails with them. We might ask them for more information and documents. 
we might ask for a trust investigator to go and attend the firm and have another look more closely at the particular problems. And then what might be the outcome of that? Well, it will depend. If they're a firm who have been able to correct their problems, that's fine. They just go off and carry on with their business. It could be that the matters are serious enough and they become a disciplinary matter. So the disciplinary team will have a look at that. And from that, it may be that conditions will be put on the practicing certificate, perhaps to engage a bookkeeper. That's a typical one. It could be re-education. We might ask them to re-attend the, the trust account course or it could be education actually into anything. It will really depend on what the problem within the firm was. Um, it could be that we'll take away their trust authorization if it's really not appropriate for them to have it because they're not keeping their records properly. Obviously, we work through this carefully with them. But we very much appreciate you for the work you do in giving us that information, so thank you for that. I thought I'd show you, uh, explain to you a couple of instances where this had some application. Um, this is where you were the, one of your fellow canaries was in the field and let us, gave us some information. So the first case study is quite a sad case study actually, and this is Lawyer C. And it may be, one of you may recognize this person. So we first heard about this person C because his external examiner telephoned us to say he could not pin this lawyer down for an appointment to go and check the records to do the external examiner's report. We tried, to we tried to contact him, we had trouble, and then myself and a colleague went to see him. And when we attended the practice, we found a man who was clearly confused and he was not able to retain information. He had a mental health condition. He really was not fit to practice at all. Um, unfortunately for him, no family member had recognized this and stepped in, no colleague had recognized this and stepped in and telephoned the board to let them know there was a problem. Um, when we saw that that was a problem, um, the board had to appoint a manager to his practice. So that's really the death knell of the practice. He was a sole practitioner, there was nobody else to take over. But the trust records were in real disarray and the matter files, his legal files were also in disarray which meant that when the manager was appointed, there was an awful lot of work to do. Now this happened about 18 months ago and this manager is still working through the files, partly because there are some legal practitioner liability committee claims going on, some negligence claims going on because of the poor handling of the matter files. The bill so far is $172,000. And that is something that the board will look to the lawyer to pay because it is his business. Um, whether he can pay it or not is another matter. Um, but it's, a, it's an extremely sad end to somebody's career, uh, but it was the external exa examiner in that case who let us know that there was a problem so that we could step in and take over the firm. That's what happened. Um, a slightly happier story is Lawyer H. Now again, um, the external examiner did, did their reporting and they let us know that there were some record keeping problems. I think in that case, there was quite a lot of dormant balances sitting around. So that came through and that particular lawyer had, quite, had some disciplinary history. He had some disciplinary findings made by VCAT about him. So because of that, we decided to engage a bit more closely with him to find out what was going on. Now, when we asked him questions again, he was slow providing information. He didn't explain how he was correcting things to us. So again, that was a red flag for us. So what we decided to do was conduct a compliance audit. So myself and my colleague attended him. Now a compliance audit is a power that the board has to attend a law practice and we can audit any part of the, the running of the firm. In this case, we just really wanted to see what was going on and what the problem was. What actually happened was, it was a very, very good session with him because we sat and spoke to him and he opened up and he explained his problems to us. So that was terrific. Um, one of the particular failings he had, which he described, was that when somebody tells him that he's made a mistake or done something wrong, he gets very offended by that. So then he sticks his head in the sand, which just makes the problem get worse and worse because it's not being attended to. So then understanding that that was his particular problem, we could try and work with him to come up with some solutions to that. And in his practice, he had some staff members who were, were quite skilled. So we suggested that he set up a program where they could assist him in particular files which were getting delayed. You can imagine that you can have an audit process that can flush these out and, and get on with them. 
and he, he also had a mentor, but he wasn't really using the mentor properly. So again, when he felt like putting his head in the sand, instead of doing that, he gets on the phone to the mentor. So that again is a matter that's ongoing, but at least H has the, has the possibility of coming good and carrying on with a successful business. Actually, the other thing I didn't tell you about Lawyer H was that, which I found very, it was very sad really, he was working seven days a week, but he was only taking home $50,000 a year. So he really, really needed to turn things around. So it was good that we were able to help him do that. And it started with the external examiner report. Okay, so we have asked for feedback or we've received feedback from external examiners. And thank you for that because it really does shine a light on what's going on. I'll just keep going. Um, so we're talking about feedback. One of the particular problems we know that happened last year was that when law practices or when you contacted us by email to our registry inbox, there were long delays in getting back to you. And for that, we are sorry. What I say this year is that process will be managed much better. And I commit that we will give you a better service this year. So I would like you to continue to, you or your law practices can ask information, ask for information through the registry inbox, but we will do a much better job this year of responding to you more quickly. We do encourage feedback. I really would like to hear your comments and questions um, and we will listen and we will be responsive. We will be having a demonstration later, but again, we can, and we will be inviting questions and comments. So if you would like to think of them along the way or people on the webinar, if you would like to get your questions down, you can send them through. Tracy will have a look at them and she can pass them on to me. But at any time, if you want to have, make a comment or ask a question, please do. The other thing that's come from the feedback is there have been some changes to the parts AB and the external examiner's report. Um, and Shaleen and Tracy will give you a demonstration later. And that's why you're all sitting at the front, so you'll be able to see it nice and clear. So, um, looking at the um, external examiner's reports from last year and the year before, these are some of the things we would like you to keep your eyes out for, in particular this year. Where there's a reconciliation not done, going on for a few months. That's a particular problem, because it tells us that the, the law practice is not on top of what's happening. We've actually had a few instances where that job of the reconciliations has been delegated to a staff member and the principal has not been checking them. There has been theft by that law clerk. This has happened in a few cases, but the principal had no idea because he had delegated everything and that is not okay. We must have the reconciliations done, preferably on time and signed off by the principal so they know, they know what's going on in their own practice. We've also noticed a problem with unpresented checks. Um, a few years ago, we had a problem with a particular law firm who um, wrote out their checks and then they put them back in the drawer and left them there. And that law firm ended up, there was <coughs> professional misconduct because that was a breach of a fiduciary duty and that law practice had to close. Um, it, of course, all unpresented checks aren't in that category. Sometimes it's something much more innocent. But we want to see those unpresented checks turned over, cancelled, send out a new one. Something else we want you to look out for is any adjustments on the reconciliations. These should be dealt with as quickly as possible, please. Dormant balances. We've had an awful problem with a lot of firms. Some, some people have dormant balances going back more than 20 years. And I hope you're horrified, but maybe you, you, you know this. Maybe you do know this. Um, getting some nods, but I'm also getting a horrified look, which I'm glad to see, because dormant balances, no, no, no amount should be there for more than 12 months, unless it's an ongoing matter. If it's an ongoing matter, that's fine. What we've noticed is that there's been some estate files where the, the, the funds have been dormant for far too long. And I would suggest that's because there's nobody on the lawyer's back getting them to do the work, and the matter just sits there. Their client has died, he was the beneficiary, uh, sorry, he was the executor and the beneficiaries don't know anything about it. So we want to pick these up and we want to get these things moving. Sorry, yes. <clears throat> Just quickly on dormant balances again, we, we see that often that the, the, they go on for a couple of years sometimes yes. and the solicitor will say to us, look, you know, that it will get cleaned up, but we're waiting on 
things to happen. Now, the alternative is we send them off to unkind monies. Yes. Is that your preference? Not particularly, not if it's a current matter. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's those that are just being sat and sat and sat because nothing is actually happening. So you are okay with Dormant Jones as if there's a legitimate reason like that. Correct. Um, and as you say, monies that should go to unclaimed monies. If, it's, if it really is an unclaimed money matter, then get it sent off and let the person who perhaps doesn't know that the solicitor is holding the money claim it through on claim money. Trustee regularities which haven't been notified to the board. We get this quite a lot. Some firms are really good with it and send through. We have one firm who sends us a, a sheet of about 10 every month. Um, anyway, we're working with them too. But trustee regularities uh, which are not notified, so we don't know anything about them. All law practices, so the practitioners, the principals, and in fact, any solicitor in the firm who knows about a law, uh, a trust irregularity should notify the board. That's their obligation. We find oftentimes that the 30th of June statement hasn't been sent out to the client. And I know if I was a client, I would want to know what was happening with my money, and law firms must send those out. So if you could keep your eyes out for those, please. Um, and then the final one is what used to be called buffer accounts. So ledger accounts in the name of the law practice, which typically have either fees that are going to the law firm or money that they don't know where it is. They don't know who it belongs to. And I know that that can be a problem, but the preferred way of dealing with it is, is to have it um, on the reconciliation. That is what we would prefer. <coughs> okay, so I'm showing you... Oh, yes, a question. Is it about the fish? Oh, no. It's not okay. About the fish. <laughs> okay, can I just over here first? Do you need a glass of water? Yes. The employer has made a mistake and they've notified you. Yes. Just us, us external examiners, when we come to do the audit, um, do we need to have to notify you guys again? Julie? Uh, if it's sorry, you need to just notify us once, but if it, if it depends, just notify us accordingly as it occurs. So if the law practice has already told the board about yeah. the irregularity, then it's not something that you need to note on your examiner's report. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Do we need to double it up again or no. report it? No, 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 no. There's no, no need to need double to. up. If it's already been notified, it's only the ones that haven't been notified. Because okay. a rule of thumb, I always tell them to CC me in it, so I know that they have said it to you. Right. Good idea, yeah. yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, you had a question. My question was, with the increasing use of people um, making direct payments, yes. and we've had a patch of experience with this, the amount of money, fortunately not very large, came into the trust account, the solicitor had no idea what, what it was for, and yes. gone, more the bank. Yes. What do you do with that? So if you have a, an amount coming into the practice where you don't know who has deposited it, and as you say, the bank don't know either, it needs to say on the reconciliation. Hopefully, in most cases, it will become clear. But if it doesn't become clear after a certain amount of time, it will be unclaimed monies. Yes. I think, I think in the majority of cases, it will become clear. But if you had to create a buffer account to balance these trust accounts, well, we say that it should stay as a, an adjustment on the reconciliation, do not create a buffer account. Well, I have no problem with the buffer account because either way it's on record and it's honest. But that is not the permitted way within the rules at the moment. I understand that. And there's always arguments on both sides, but we, yeah. Okay, all right, so big fish, little fish. This slide is about um, try and look at the big fish problems and don't worry too much about the little fish problems, okay? Um, try not to get bogged down with things that are minor and try and make sure that you have your eyes open for the big things. So you will report little fish problems, but you won't get bogged down with them. That's really what we're trying to say. So what are little fish problems? So things like delays during school holidays in getting receipts done or reconciliations done or delays during the Christmas break. Those are not ma major matters. If the law firm has a bookkeeper, but the bookkeeper doesn't come in very often, which means sometimes things get delayed, the fact that they've got a bookkeeper puts that problem in the little fish pile. Where there are minor balances under $20, that probably should go to unclaimed money. If that's the problem, that's a small problem. We want to focus on the big ticket items. Minor technical breaches, perhaps where the checks don't haven't crossed out, where it says all bearer. Don't worry too much about that. Of course, as I say, you will report it, 
but it's not the biggest of deals. Where there are registers that are being kept that are blank, but we know that there are no, there's nothing to put on them. Again, it should be marked nil, but it's not the biggest of deals. And again, the, one of the problems is registers with no addresses, and we know that that can be a problem with, with those who are using Lee. So it, it's not the biggest of fish problems. Okay? So think big fish, little fish. Okay, so um, current things that are on our radar for the board and the commissioner, um, and also for, we work closely with New South Wales, we work closely with the Law Institute here, and we work closely with the Uniform Commissioner, and we are going to start working more closely with Western Australia. And as a group together, we know that there are particular problems. We just spoke about one now where you have buffer accounts. Should it be a buffer account? Should it be um, on the reconciliation? And there are a few of these problems that are floating around that we, as a group, try to resolve. And I can tell you what they are. So where they're, well, with e-conveyancing, where law practices are dealing with PEXA. The question is, is the money that's coming in trust money when it goes into the PEXA source account? Um, what type of trust money is it? And therefore, what kind of, what, what role or what action does the lawyer have to take when receiving that money? This is an issue and that we are trying to resolve at the highest level. Rules that don't take into account modern technology, I might say, and when I say modern technology, I mean BPEG. Um, which isn't, which has been around quite a long time, but it doesn't give you the ability to write down the BSD and account number. So that's actually a breach of the rules. We're trying to sort that out at a higher level. It might be a rule change. We'll see, but we're working on that. Intermixing of money when money is received for disbursements. Um, so you may typically get a get, get a, a, a lump sum that goes into the trust account, but actually the disbursement is office money, not trust money. Typically with those things, we say, if you clear it up pretty quickly, it's not a problem. Take that money out within a few days and that's fine. Or if the client's dropped it into the wrong account, take it out pretty quickly and that's fine. Um, but the um, intermixing is another issue that we are dealing with and thinking about. Where there are registers with no transactions on them, there's some inconsistencies between the different states that we want to address. Um, Christine was telling me that in Victoria, some of the rules have changed with the State Revenue Office in accepting unclaimed money. So we'll be having a good look at that and seeing what we can do there. Because sometimes rule changes or we can influence other government departments. And the EE course itself, there's, there's a review of that and that's being uh, dealt with by Shaleen here and Marco Zanon, who's slipped into the back of the room, who some of you will know, as well as New South, well be, New South Welsh people and the Uniform Commissioner, they're all looking at that as part of an EE course review. So those are some of the things that are on our <coughs> radar. Okay, so I told you that you, I've got a question, yes. Um, so with PEXA, yes. I noticed they always charge fees on their accounts. So it goes into the trust account and they take fees from there. And I know you guys are against taking fees from the trust account. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be redirected to the office account. And I, I talked to PEX and they don't allow that. Marco, do you know? Can uh, you add anything? I, I, it's, it's probably similar to, um, to, to the lawyers, because typically the lawyers basically straight out of the PEXA transaction and stuff. So I mm. um, think it's, has a service been provided? Probably has. Um, so, yeah, I'm. That itself is kind of like intermixing money as well, yeah. yeah um, so I'm sure it's one of the things that Marco will now write down and talk about at the E because he's on that he's on that working group. Yeah, because yeah. like when you see the breakdown of PEXA, you see all these fees coming out. Yeah. On that breakdown, and it's come directly to the trust account. So that's something that I wasn't comfortable with, and I and I talked to PEX about it, and they they couldn't find a solution for us as well. Okay, so do we have an answer, or will we come back to you? We'll on come that? back to you on that. Thank you. Would you mind leaving us your name? Oh, of course, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we rely on you. You are our eyes and our ears. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. These questions are pertinent to all of us. Yes. Instead of just answering the question, okay. could we all be... Yes. All right. I'll do that. Of the answers. Thank you for your feedback. Good idea. All right. So you are our, the board's eyes and ears. And we would like you to let us know in relation to some of those red flag moments 
but we would also, so in particular, I might suggest that you let us know if you see ill health in a practitioner. I don't mean just moderately, you know, just a, the flu or something, but if you know somebody perhaps going into hospital to have some major surgery, and particularly if you know that there isn't support networks or other lawyers within the practice who can step in if needed, please let us know. If you see financial difficulties within the firm, if you happen to see that, we would like to know about it because that's indicative of a law practice who is not managing very well. And that is the escalating problem that the Melbourne University found when they were looking at those VCAT decisions. So financial difficulties like not being able to pay their GST, not paying staff entitlements, not paying barristers, and actually not paying you either. And not paying you is a breach of the rules. So do let us know if this is happening. If you see the state of the practice is really messy, that again indicates they're not coping and we would like to know about that. So if you see files all over the floor, um, if you see documents are not secured, I'm sure if you were the client of that firm, you wouldn't like the files to be kept in that way, particularly if there other people can read names and details on them, that's really not appropriate. And let us know if it goes too far in them putting you off. So if you try to make appointments and you keep getting put off and put off, and, and not just once or twice perhaps, but when it goes on and on and on, let us know, please. Because we are relying on you. Okay. Yes. Um, how can we rely on your investigators and their reports that we don't see? How can you ask me that? Mm -hmm. I have a slide. My next slide is just going to tell you that. Oh. Thank you for the question. And he's not a plant either. Okay, <laughs> it's actually my very next point. So we commit to keeping you updated. Um, and that is a very fair point. So what we do is if the law firm that you are the external examiner of has a trust investigation report written about it, then we will send you a copy of that report. You're not sure? You're not believing me? When, when did you start that policy? Because last year I read the summary report and by chance I saw the report within their office. Okay. Um, and, it, and it basically drew my attention to something I've been wondering about. So we were both on the same score. Yes. And uh, I thought, well, why didn't they, the practitioner, uh, provide their details to me? Don't know to this day why they didn't. Yeah. But why didn't the, uh, the, 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 the practitioner board. board inform me? Because yes. the, um, Ironically enough, the um, the matter had commenced after the 31st of March 2018. Yeah. And but I, we're still running our reports up to the middle of May. It yeah. happened in that interval. Well, I'm sorry that that one didn't come through, and I can only think it was either a mistake or there was some particular reason in that case it didn't happen. But our general policy is we, um, when the reports are written, one of the on the sign up block on the sign off block it says that they can send to us sending a copy to the EE. They'll sign up and we will send you a copy. And that's what we try to do because of course you need to know what the problems within the firm are so that when you go, you can have a particular look for those particular problems. So I'm sorry in that case it didn't happen and I'm, I'm not sure why, but we've been doing that for about 18 months. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the only sort of proviso is um, those special complaint investigations. Um, so yes, if we get a, if we, there are a couple of way, reasons we do a trust investigation. One is if we've decided for whatever reason that this firm is a high risk, so we will look at, go and have a look at the firm and we'll do a trust investigation. <coughs> the other reason is if we get a complaint. So typically, the, as Marco says, the report about the complaint doesn't typically go to the external examiner uh, because in fact we don't at that point show it to the law firm. But I think that that's a very good point of feedback and I, I think we will make a note of that and change that and at some point you will get that report. In this particular case, the firm was disagreeing with the verdict by the investigator. Ah, uh, maybe they refused. And, I, and so therefore, maybe yeah. that was the reason. But, yeah. but as, as I said today, I still haven't got the report from you. Yes. So I got a chance to sort well, of... Well, without consent, we feel that we can't do that. Well, did we, are, we are external examiners and we should have access to all records. So I beg the question, why don't we get it? Yeah, did the law firm um, give you a copy? 
Well, I grabbed them. Yes. I mean, no, I, I, I saw them. I said, that's mine. So you, you solved the problem in a practical way. So, um, and by luck. By luck. Yes, I, I appreciate that. But certainly that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that you are in the loop and you do know what we've been doing in the trust investigation space. Thank you. Thank you. Just on that point, yeah. I suppose um, under what Australian auditing standards, forgetting about the rules, when you do a planning meeting, you're actually meeting with the trust account manager and the principal, you actually... One of my questions is, you know, has there been any investigation? Yes. Before? So that's fundamental. Before I sign my opinion for the subsequent event requirement under the auditing standard, the mandatory pass for that. So if there's something that happened outside the trust account period, yeah. it should also be disclosed. So do you, do you ask if they've had a complaint? Of course. Yeah, that's a fair question. Yeah. So, yeah. So we said this, that's good practice, but yes. we're not doing an audit here, we're doing an examination. Yeah. yeah. My reputation's under the line, my first point of the national reputation standards. Part of the reason I got was that that was asked on the audit uh, uh, financial year. Okay. And, and my answer was, well, basically, on the day I signed this report, it's still part of my um, events leading up to the yep. subsequent mm -hmm. events. Yep. So yep. they had the reasons why maybe they didn't tell me, but basically I had to point out to them yep. that, um, that this was part of the requirements of the Fraud Title Concern Fund would be in good practice. Yeah, good. Look, following on from that, yep. shouldn't, I'm passing the buck back to you people, yes. shouldn't you periodically prepare a newsletter and email to all of us the problems that you are identified or found in examinations and so on during the year? But basically, I'm not saying it's really, yep. I tend to think that we've been kept in the dark a bit. Well, I really hope that sessions like today can start that better conversation between us and that's what I would really very much like to do. So something like a newsletter is a terrific idea and I certainly am the manager of the team looking after that and that is something that I would certainly take on board, yes. Okay, so um, as I say, we send the investigation reports when we have consent um, and we will also provide you with feedback when you Give your external examiner report and there are serious problems, we'll give you some feedback as well. We commit to doing that. So what I'd say to you is if you have any concerns, contact us through the registry inbox, which I think are the details you already have. <coughs> or you can telephone us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, or you can telephone us. But what I would say is if you come across these problems before the end of the trust year, don't wait. Don't wait till the end of the trust year. Let us know straight away. Because as you see, we can implement some programs with the law firm and help them out. Because generally speaking, we're trying to get them into healthy practice. I've got an issue. Yep. I don't know whether I step foot back to a question trial or not, the intermixing of money. Yes. There is a very good argument that the clients should never know the details of the solicitor's office account. Because nowadays with people paying so much online, yes. and they need inadvertently, trust money can be paid into office account. Yes. I think it's better to have all the monies paid to the solicitor go into the trust account, um, they can then segregate it, the ones I've got, I've always been very honest in that, and I've watched it carefully, and uh, there's no problems. Then they can transfer weekly, daily, monthly, or what have you, from trust to office. But if it goes, the way it's being forced now is a greater chance of trust money going into the office account directly. Awesome. I'm just, I've just done, had an interview, review on one solicitor. Yes. And his checkbook is going rusty. <laughs> Everything goes all straight into the trust account. He hardly writes a check for the whole year. Yes. And I, I think there's a real danger in all this direct. Uh, paying and depositing. Okay, well I mean I don't know whether anybody has a comment about that. I mean we can take that on board and you know it is, it, it, there are a lot of things that don't work necessarily well. Sometimes the um, the rules don't fit in the way that you would hope them to fit. Um, but anyway, but, but thank you for your comment. So Maggie, I, yes. I think the issue is that solicitors are doubling up all their transactions if it's going through the trust account and then through the office account as well. So I accept your point, it's a good one because it would minimise the possibility of intermixing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think from the firm's point of view, they just want to get paid straight to their office account as quickly as possible. But isn't there the danger of there also being non-trust money in that that then goes into the office account? 
and you've been too mixed in that way. Sure, there's doubling up of all the accounting as yeah. well. And yes, and each solicitors want to retain the old system, which we've been in <coughs> for 50, 60 years, has never caused a problem. It's spot on. Okay, yes. Of the more practical reasons for why the solicitors won't do that is because basically, they, they, if more transactions going through the trust account, there's more time the auditors go up, yes. and therefore the cost goes up. <laughs> and, I, and I've been told that. Yes, right? yes I can see that. That's so the they, case. they say, we'll, we'll do our best to push everything through the office account, but then there's trust for that. Of course, it's got to go to trust account, but yes. fill out directly back to office. Okay, all right. Well, that's the end of the information I want to give you. So we've had quite a lot of comments and I might pass on to Shaleen. We can have more comments later and more conversation, but I'll pass on to Shaleen here. There is just one question. Oh, oh yes, a yeah, question. So a question from Rob just has been, um, been waiting for a while. So the question is, um, with a new client practice and a new trust account that has not been examined by an external examiner, however, the trust records have been examined by the LIB and reported an issue. Uh, a number of items identified. Am I required to address such again? Again, my reporting following my annual visit. That is, am I required to report the same items? Obviously, I need to review and ensure things have changed, but do I need to report? So this is a someone who's had a, a trust investigator who's noted the items. They've obviously been given a copy of the report because the external examiner knows this. Should they be? Should they have to uh, repeat all that in their report? Marco? Unless they want to make a note just to say, uh, either confirm or whether they see any improvement since that investigation. So they can make the note that they have read that report yeah. from the trust investigator dated such a date. My comments, apart from all that, are yeah. things have improved, things haven't improved. Yeah, if there's been an opportunity, yeah, that, that's what I'd be looking for. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to briefly talk about um, the external examiner's working group and improvements to the online watchman forms, and then I'll go into a demonstration of the parts A, B, and the external examiner's report. Um, so the external examiner's group takes feedback from both states, which is listened to at the highest level, and the working group consists of Christine Bell, Marco Zan, who's at the back there, and myself. And we also, can, uh, in conjunction with New South Wales and uh, the Legal Services National Commission, we consult with each other and um, look at making, at the moment, we're looking at making improvements to the external examiner's course. Um, we ha have also uh, been consulting about the form, the online form, where New South Wales had requested Part C just be referred to as the external examiner's report. Uh, so that we will still, uh, Victoria will still take references to Part C. Uh, so improvements to the online lodgements. Uh, it's a new modern look and it is now device friendly and browser friendly. So you can now use it on mobile phones or tablets, etc. Uh, there has been, there are new notes to clar clarify definitions, which is just by clicking on a question mark. I'll show you that in the demonstration. Uh, the main questions that have changed in part B relate to the deficiencies and overdrawn ledgers. And these changes have flowed through to the external examiner's report. Uh, the questions in the external examiner's report have been clarified. So it's now more yes, no answers. Um, as you are the eyes and ears, we have made changes to the breaches box. This will allow you to paint a picture to explain the situation. Um, you will be required to document the law practices response and what they are going to do in the situation, do so the situation does not occur again. Uh, logic has been put into the back end of the external examiner's report to resolve issues around the, um, for example, the ability to say there are unrestored deficiency when there was no deficiency. Uh, the changes to the layout will assist our office 
to identify quickly concerns that you may have. Um, so before I go on to the demonstration, does anyone have any other questions or comments at this point in time? So you have some on the webinar? Yeah. Uh, so the first one uh, from Arthur, is there a reasonable audit fee scale range? As I have heard from various clients that they are getting quoted very low fees range, which <laughs> as a concern of how much audit detail is being conducted. Mm -hmm. We usually don't get involved in the <laughs> charging of these. That's something I, I can see Marco shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want an comment on that, Marco? No comment. No no comment. <laughs> yeah, because we, we don't. Come, yeah, that's between the client, the law practice, and the external examiner to come to an agreement on that. Do you, as auditors, have a collegiate group where you talk to each other about these things? But can I make a comment on that one on the fees? Uh, Sometimes you know that physically it is, it is impossible to do an examination at a fee. So I think the board should take into account if the fees are so low, where the, the, the independent examination uh, is in question. So why are the fees low if you need to do more work? Uh -huh. well, no, actually, I totally agree with that. It's, it's exactly how it's happening with the SMSF industry at the mm -hmm. moment, with yeah. the low fees. Because how can you physically do a whole examination under five hundred dollars? And that's sometimes that's what we're competing against. And I'm like, that's even for a brand new um, trust account, you can't do it for five hundred dollars. And that's some of the um, quotes that we're coming up against. And I think that's a red flag for you guys straight away. Is are they actually doing their jobs properly? Um, hmm. So what actually does the industry practice? Yeah. Yeah. Send back their top ten clients, get the turnover of the company, or the, uh, the uh, audit fee. So that would be something pretty easy that you guys could do. I would have thought. Before we start to start the issue. Okay. So from the second tier firm, and we're competing with signatures for hire, very low ball. Okay. Go to the practice. Okay, so this is something quite new for me, actually. There's another comment at the back. Yeah, because when you look at the last external examination, examiner's uh, course. The kind of work, the kind of uh, material that we'll, we were given, and the kind of planning that we need to do, you can you can you, you should be able to think how much work need to do before you need to start the examination. Yeah. And uh, and if you don't want to do a systematic and proper examination, some of the fees quoted are just impossible. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, the board has got to take this into account in terms of what what kind of quality examination they, they, they that need to be done in order to be able to produce. A good year and good eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, we'll take that on board. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so is, it, is there a case for a peer review process? So no, I'm just asking that, no, but if, if the work's being done, fees are fee. But if the work isn't being done, then we can't question it. I don't know, I mean, I guess that's for you to review. The fees are low, then I guess it's your your job to have well, all that. What it's not if the fees are low. Yeah. If the work is being done, it's more than you get the job unless you quote. Well. Yeah, but it's mm -hmm. a chance, there's a higher chance for them to not do the job well if the yeah. fees are that low. So then that's where I guess that's, there's sort of yeah. certain benchmarks. Yeah. There's an obvious red flag here for the board because where you've got practitioners who have a number of trust account audits mm -hmm. and they don't find breaches, yes. I suspect they're the ones which are actually going in and doing the light board. And, and it is happening. And, okay. and I, I've just had a couple which have just uh, clients which have left and they've gone to somebody, they're Sydney-based clients, yeah. and they've gone to someone who's 50 kilometres away as a yeah. practitioner. Yeah. So I suspect something like that's occurring. So would you be happy to tell me who they were? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that information from you. We might move on from this one because that is perhaps something yeah, that their working something. group would be interested in. Um, there are just a couple more questions online. Um, what, uh, one from Peter, uh, what is the opinion on surprise visits now that there is hardly ever a check in the mail? Uh, surprise visits are no longer uh, done anymore and since the introduction of the uniform law. Um, it's just an, a one-year one mm -hmm. annual examination. So there was under the old act surprise visits, but no longer under the uniform. But so, but I mean, yes, yes, the records can only need to be examined once a year. But how you conduct that examination 
is still your prerogative, I say. It's still up to you how you want to conduct that annual examination. Now, it may be over two visits. It doesn't necessarily have to be over But it's no longer called surprise. You can go anytime you want, or you can inform the, the client that you're coming. But in the past, in the, from the previous act, that you are not supposed to, and there are certain specific provisions to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not going to answer for the uni changes in the uniform law, but yeah, that, I mean that that was in the in the previous act. Um, it was a requirement for a surprise visit. That's no longer required in the uniform law. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, still, how you conduct your external examination, still up to you. You are allowed to do more than three visits if you want to. According to the new act, it doesn't say anything. It's silent. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. That's very interesting. Um, so, we have a demo. Yes. The LIB are going to show us how wonderful their IT is. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Sam. <laughs> We can carry on with the questions while this is happening if anybody else wants to. <laughs> um, if there's anything else. Well, I have a problem. Yes. I lost one recently because they said I was too dear. I had to train the bookkeeper. Yes. The bookkeeper. He didn't know what to do for me. Yes. I should work on training her. And then his solicitor's tax account yeah. told him that his audit account was too dear. Yes. So he wrote to you people and just gave him the green light to change. Right. You, no one contacted me to find out why was my account so dear. Yes. I had it right. Every, yes. every inch of what I charged was documented. Yes. I, I think you people must support the audience when they're acting very Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting there, okay. So maybe if you people don't really know each other, this can be a good opportunity for you to introduce um, <laughs> <laughs> yourself even to each other or phone numbers or... All I am happy was, how come we always have to give our date of birth? That's one oh. thing that annoys me. <laughs> oh, oh that, that's um, for, so you can get a login account for LSB online. Yes. So the practitioners... To identify you properly. Yeah, so because practitioners also have to no, not on the form A, but... No, to the board they do. We know their date of birth. There's no date of birth on the forms at all, nowhere else. So when a, pra when a practitioner is registered with the board, they give their date of birth. Well, and that gives... A and B for external, oh, no, yes. Yeah. And they're given a, a, a practitioner number, so that's their, a unique identifier. So that number is appears on the part A and part B, which behind it I sits their date of birth. But it, it's just a way of identifying you. To make You're sure we know who you are. To the actual oh. external examiner's form. Correct. So yeah. the ones that I sent to my clients. If you've already given it, uh, you don't need to give it again. So, like, so long as you're already registered on the database. Oh, so I can leave that blank. Yeah, you can leave it. You don't have to always have to give it. <laughs> if this is the best thing you've taken away from today, you'll be happy. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so long as you've got a uh, registered LSB online account and you're registered with the board, that's fine. Okay. okay, and we can now go live to the demonstration. Okay, so we're logging as the key first, please, Tracy. So I'll just briefly go through part A confirmation and part B statement of cost me. So 
So you just uh, you always click on forms or either up the top there or down below. And yeah, that's here. So we'll go into this law that's just part A first. So um, basically this is just a one page summary of the name of the law practice, etc., with the seven questions. And where I was referring to the question mark before, the law practice can just click on the question mark and they can get a definition of what controlled lending is, for example. Um, so that hopefully will help them answer the questions more clearly. So we'll go on to, we'll go on to part B now. So you'll see there's all the tabs along the top there. Um, it's unusual that you'll have a law practice with every single tab. So but that just helps you identify if they've missed something that you just need to go back to them and say, hey, you haven't um, revealed this information about um, specific power, for example. So the first one is just a summary page for the law practice, which also has the external examiner details. Um, and one question and then the summary of the trust account and statutory deposit account details. And then the next tab, which is the trust and SDA. So that's got the three boxes that must be consoled, which is the general trust account, cash book and the trial balance. Uh, you may sometimes get queries from the law practice saying they can't reconcile them. So, you know, your assistance is appreciated. Uh, so then you've got the questions in relation to the uh, deficiency report and the over, overdrawn and dormant balances. So there's some additional questions there. And then the usual maintaining of the trust account and the area of law which you don't need to examine, that's a small survey for the board. So that, yeah, and if we go to controlled money, so that has similar questions. Um, again, the maintaining of it, if it's manual or computer, and again, the area of law to which that relates to. Again, that, that part you don't need to examine. And you've got investments, uh, similar questions to control of money, you said we don't need to the breakdown of the area of law. Uh, then you've got uh, specific power, nothing new there, and other. So in part B now, you've got the, you have to add all the trusting industries, there's no longer attachments in part B. Uh, so you can add up to 40, um, trust signatories and then you've got the question two questions in relation to register of powers and states and final is the certification so that's just, uh, how, how that they, all the accounts that they've maintained the registers and that they've kept the records in accordance <coughs> with the law and rules and that, that completes the outlay of Part B. So now what we will do is log on as an external examiner and complete the external examiner's report. So you can either go up to forms at the top or on the green bar. Uh, you select on the bar and then you hit create. So you've got the summary, so that's just providing your summary of the law practice's name and the scope of the examination. Then you've got the uh, breaches tab. So you, you can add a breach, you say yes or no, so we're saying yes in this example, and you click add, select the relevant section or act the rule reference. And you can put, you know, it's got scope to put in information in the three boxes below, as outlined. 
And is that right, Tracy? These are it's four hundred characters for 400 each. Four hundred characters for right. each of the um, extent of breach, explanation, and outcome. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And just hit continue. <coughs> um, what you also may just uh, if you see down the bottom here, if you find that. Uh, that there has been a problem with part B, you may want to save the draft first and then go on restart part B and just um, just letting the law practice know there's a figure or something they need to fix up in part B and then you can continue on with your external examiner's report. So we won't do that in this case, we'll just, that's just to show you what the little dollar reports that comes up. Uh, so then uh, we'll go through, so we've added a breach, you can add up to 40 breaches. So we'll go into the next tab, which is the opinion tab. Now we've basically outlined these questions as yes, no questions. So the first one we'll just say yes. And yes again. And this, yeah, that's yes and the next one uh production of records yes and this is it should match with what's been mentioned in part b say have not And then we've got uh, questions in relation to the deficiency. So we'll say yes. And this, the DLRs that is designated local regulatory authority being the board of the New South Wales Law Institute. And we'll say no to this question and no again. This is where you can add where there's been deficiencies. So you, uh, you put in the details in relation to the deficiency, the date, name of the account, what description, the reason why this occurred, and the amount. Yeah. If it's been restored, then they notified to the board. So continue. So again, this is 20, is that right? We can put in Tracy? Yeah, 20, yes. And the next one, overdrawn reports, similar. Uh, we say yes, yes and no. Just a question with those, uh, um, can they be pre-populated if they've been reported to you guys? No, we haven't, we don't have a, uh, if we only want to know about ones that haven't been reported to us. So if they've already been reported to us and rectified, we don't need to know about the ones that haven't been reported or rectified. Okay, uh, if, if the dormant balances have they been attended to? And final comments, if we say yes, and now it opens up another dialogue box, which is this a thousand characters, Tracy? Yeah. Yeah, a thousand characters that allows you to put in there. So there's no room for attachments in the external examiner's report either. So if we had to write a longer thing, we'll just put please refer to attached letter. Well, they <laughs> try to keep you within their thousand, but if it's a bigger problem, call us. Call us, yeah. <laughs> I'll have more contact than just through that box. But you need to try and keep it, well, you need to keep it to a thousand. Yeah, Unless we get your feedback that that's not enough and we will try and do something about it. But I always like to have the option. Well, we're trying to cover everything <laughs> on the online form. So okay. if you've got great concerns, yeah, as Maggie has said, yeah, the rules say don't get hung up on the online. It's more important to give the right information. Yeah, I understand that. Take a fair comment. Comment? Uh, yes. That, that last section is final comments. Mm -hmm. um, 
I sort of wondered as to what you should put in there, but if there's a breach, you've gone through the breach, and if there's something on the borderline, you make a final comment. I think last year I got stuck on that. It said basically I have to go back and put it under a breach. Now, is that still the case? Or maybe it could have been just I know made... in, if you mentioned about uh, deficiencies, about being unrestored, that in, in case of breach, but final comments. That might be something like the law firm is in a terrible mess. There's papers everywhere. Maybe those are the kind of comments. No, basically, I tried to make a comment in there, yeah. which is the matter I've referred to before, and I couldn't. And it kept on saying it was a breach. So you wouldn't allow you to type in a comment? No, no. And that's what I was doing. I'm fairly sure that was happening because I went backwards and forwards, and in the end, um, I was, what I was doing was saying, well, you already know about it. Yeah. Um, why should I have to comment on it in that final comment thing? And I it couldn't get it to work properly. So I went back and thought, well, um, okay. that, that is a breach. That shouldn't and not that, happen, And yeah. pressed the button away it went. So, and then, then they came back to me and said, why did you, why did you do that in the report? Because you hadn't told us beforehand. I said, well, you didn't tell me. So we had a sort of a standoff. But I mean, so it was all to do with the fact that I was trying my best to so basically do so it's up to him in the middle, it wouldn't allow me. So would you like a telephone call if that yeah, should happen yeah, again? Yeah, call, call, yeah, yeah, you can um, call the... I think that was sort of on the 14th or 15th of um, May, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know, we're generally quite busy then. Yeah. 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 And we can guide you through yeah. having problems with the online watching. Like yeah. yeah. To me it was the first year last year. The system. I thought maybe it was just a glitch in the system, so. Yeah, no, that shouldn't should. have happened, but yeah, so, but if you have problems this year, just please call us and we can try and guide you over the phone. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. The last year I had to submit a, a lengthy report, so I was asked to attach the report and send it to Trust Investigation at LSB. Yeah. Is that, is that the normal procedure now? So, send things, well, the, the, I don't want to get people confused with the different email addresses. The trust investigation box is my team's box. Generally speaking, use the registry inbox, um, but probably Christine Bell uh, was in correspondence with you and she told you to use this other box. That's probably what happened. So just use the registry inbox unless, you, unless you're in particular contact with somebody. Thank you. Okay, so, and then you've got, uh, continuing on, got the disclaimer. And then we'll go to the final tab, the certification. Um, so we'll we won't we we'll just uh, won't bother about the email address at this point because we just want to show you what occurs if if there's an error. Um, so if you want to hit submit, please, Tracy. Yeah. So it comes up with errors in point form. So basically all you just need to do is click on the error and it, it will take you directly to where the errors occurred on the form. So you just rectify that accordingly. But if you do have any problems with the online form, please call us and we can guide you through it. This error has come up because if, um, in your opinion um, there have been trust records which have not um, met the requirements, there needs to be at least a one breach. Yes. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate that mm -hmm. because there was no breaches and uh, within the opinion the records have not met the requirements, then yeah. there needs to That's be at least logical. one breach. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just change that to now. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if it's going to work because there's, we'll see what happens. Oh, you don't need a game. I know, that's all right. Okay. Um, 
it would it would still come up. Yeah. So how would that be other questions? Um, this should allow us to submit now. If you want to say anything else in the poll before I move on. Uh, unless anyone else has any particular questions on the external here. Yeah. Yes. Just on the question about the registers. Yes. So this is if they, they might have a register, but it's nil, and they put NA in. Uh, in, in I mean, they, they get it wrong. It? Yeah, they get it wrong. You want to know? You want to know about? It. So you have to. You remember that's one of the small fish problems, and yes. you have to report it. But yeah. we know it's a small fish problem, yeah. and we're not going to get. We and you are not going to get too hung up on. It. No. Any other questions or comments before we hit submit? Okay. Oh, you can, I mean, as you, you can view Part B from the external examiner's report, so that's a, you see all the tabs, you just click on them and just scroll down, and then you can just go back to the external examiner's report. And you can download it? We won't download you know, yeah, you've got to, you we can download, download it, we tried this it this morning, morning and it didn't, it didn't like it, didn't not like on it, the so, system. But you can, yeah. It, when you hit when we hit submit, you will be emailed a copy of the final submission anyway. So, I'll just go back to forms and I'll just show that all is now complete. <laughs> so that ends the demo the online demonstration of the forms. And we're now going to go seamlessly back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so these are important key dates. Uh, part A and B, which is done by the law practice, must be in by the 30th of April, and the external examiner's report by the 31st of May. Um, as mentioned up there, we don't have the legislative ability to provide extensions. Um, so if you, you may want to start after the session making some appointments with your law practices, to so you can get it in on time. Um, I, I just to let you know that today's session can be contributed towards your CPD. I've contacted the three main accounting bodies. Um, they're set to maintain documentation such as the email that was sent to you, and we are looking at putting this webinar on our website. So they can um, listen to us again. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any other questions at this point? Yeah. Well, saying this forum, who chose the 31st of May one month after basically we get the forms from the uh, it's mm -hmm. totally done. impractical. Yeah, that, because something. we're in the middle of doing other audits. We're in the middle of the tax office requirements, and you give us a month to do that work. And uh, take that feedback. Um, that's something that was uh, decided by the Legal Services Council. Um, it didn't because we had changed the trust. The one we chose or suggested yeah, either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't you go back to the Legal Services Council and tell them to get lost? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this for 50 years, and it used to be 
because it was one day, and then you had three months after the end of the year, the audit team was to get the whole thing done. Now you've got flood and so forth. Most solicitors don't get the stuff ready until later in the paper. And you've got one month and a bit to do it. I, I try to do as much as I can beforehand, but it's, it's crazy and it's irresponsible. You're not giving the auditors a chance to do their job properly. And if you want to get this done as well as it ought to be, you lobby them and tell them that more time is needed. It's yeah. absolutely bloody stupid. That's the only way I can describe it. Okay, yeah, yeah. I can feed that back to the... Yeah. Uh, we so we do know that, but we're, 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 yeah. Will you tell them at a meeting of the orders here, I'll do this actually, he's not on. Yeah. 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 This is, I know, a lot of that law, I often don't have so much common sense in that you know. There was feedback given to the Lessons Services Board, and I know I did a bit um, uh, when the changes occurred. And part of the problem was going to that 31 March year end, the 31 October suited everyone a lot better, especially us auditors, right? And I, uh, the practical reason I believe is that practicing certificates for solicitors are issued um, by the 30th of June. So they need to know that their trust accounts are in order before they actually issue the practice. That certificates. was one part of the reason. Yeah. The other part is to be consistent with all the other states and territories right. of Australia. Yep. Yeah. So, well, could I waste your time by telling you a quick story when I told you? When the New York Times came in and I realised just how practical it was, I made some telephone calls to New South Wales. It's about some meeting sort of law practice up there. I said, how long does your order come in and actually go through your records? You know what he said to me? Um, this is a, a four partner firm. I don't think one day. You know, I can barely sit down and have a cup of tea at the solicitor's office in one day. And I'm not too sure whether they're getting the same standard of audit up there as we've been trying to do here. Mm -hmm. I, I think we basically need to take the strongest stance on that, on that issue that has been taken so far. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Yes, another one. Yeah. Yep. I've recently been contacted by some lawyers who have sent me trust accounts in the last month. Yes. And obviously, they're not on my list. So, how long will it be before they get onto your system by the system where I can hold your form to the procedure? Uh, well, have they notified us that there's been well, they've they've just Notified. Yeah, they need to notify the court that there's been an open trust account. They've opened the trust account. Yeah, and so, and so that, are, are you going to be their external yeah. examiner? And they also need to notify us that you're going to be their external examiner. Yeah, that, yeah. that's in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm asking if that document goes to the board, how long before it goes onto my list of audit clients that I have to do that I can actually complete the form to see? Well, so if they let, if they let us know or your team know this week, would yeah, we should be about to hopefully um, within two weeks. Okay. So we need to be in cons consultation with the bank as well to confirm opening date, um, and then we will um, then that trust account will be registered. And so long as you're registered with that law practice as well as the external examiner, you should then be able to have access. To the external examiner's report. Right. Yeah. If you have any queries, please just give us a call and we can see what's going on. Yeah, supporting oh. feedback online, certainly around the time frames. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> we're in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's also a question um, Have the LIB or LSB um, developed an updated EE checklist to be used in the conduct of our examination? So there was a checklist about Yeah, that's that hasn't, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been updated. That hasn't changed at all, Martha? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that, was, that was something that, that was developed by the Law Society in New South Wales. Um, and I'm not yeah, I'm not aware of any changes to it. Um, yeah, the same one as Martha. But still relevant? This, this yes, still yes, relevant. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, um, good question. Does anyone look at the matter by themselves? So, uh, you're asking your colleagues, do they all look at the matter yeah. files? Yes, yes, yes. yes. required under the thing to actually look at the file and see. Because they're supposed to keep all the trust receipts, all the registers that they, my clients kept them separately. But then in terms of the matter file itself, it's all the legal work. 
stuff in there. So people are saying yes, they do. Yeah, that's the only interesting part of the job. <laughs> 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 After attending seminars like this, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your yes, your colleagues do. Yeah, yeah. so I think you have to check that they're maintaining the file. So that's the only way to make sure. Just the old one, you guys. On, on the old one, you're supposed to see if there's actually open up the matters. The files has been completed. There's actually work done. But under the new uniform law, there is actually nothing that says you've got to make sure that. I mean. You gotta make sure they're actually doing the work, but whether how much the thing, how thick the file, or how much the thin file is, how do you know that is sufficient work? That's true. Some sometimes the file they provide the correspondent files or other files where they have a litigation. So you don't really have to look practically, but for practical purposes, you don't have to look at everything. But the day-to-day -day correspondence is involved in the sense that sometimes maybe maybe a trust matter which is not recorded. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, a transit money, they can record. However, they want money is received, money is taken, but that is not that is not publicly filed up. In a, with, they don't require to have a register, so they don't have to file it separately. But normally, it's maintained in the meta file. So that is one of the area consider the meta file may contain trust documents yeah. that we may encounter that we cannot find it elsewhere. Okay. All right. I'll start to make you now. Yeah. For the final so we're section. wrapping up. We're we're on the very very last homeward straight, and I won't keep you very much longer. But I do think it's really interesting if you guys talk to each other because obviously you could, you've got lots of ideas and opinions, and you can share information and assist each other. So I don't know whether you do want to um, have a collegiate group or even just swap emails or something at the end of the session. Okay, um, right, sorry. Why don't you try? Last people have put their names, submit their names to you, but to get a, a an examiner's discussion group, working group. You know, there's discussion groups for lots of other issues, there's plenty, right. of, plenty of discussion groups for superannuation and all that sort of thing. I've been doing it for 50 years and there's never been a decent group for this sort of work. Okay, so we have all your email addresses so that we could facilitate something where we um, allow you to come together if you wish to. So we could certainly um, try and facilitate that and we'll look at that. Okay. All right, well, I'm not going to invite any more comments or questions because we've had lots and we're, we're now running out of time. Um, but I want to commit to continuing the conversation with you in the best way that we can, and that's current <coughs> concerns, emerging concerns, whatever's happening in the future. But thank you very much for everybody attending today. Thank you for being so interested, um, interesting, and for con contributing to today's discussion. So thank you very much.